All right, welcome to Physics Questions and Answers. This will be episode three. We are going to go across a couple uh, questions that a member submitted and just had a couple questions on. So let's talk about them. This first question says, which technique results in a three-dimensional image? And again, when I talk about answering multiple choice questions, the best thing to do is just try to answer the question without looking at the multiple choice. And if then if the answer that you have in your mind is there, you just pick that one. But if you're just not sure, then we kind of, let's uh, eliminate some of them. So if we look at the four options that we have, surface rendering, spatial compounding, harmonic resonance, elastography, which of these would give us a three-dimensional image? I'm not going to go in order, but I want to talk about a couple of these. The last one, elastography. Uh, that is, typically you want to associate elastography with one other word, and that word would be stiffness. What the machine does is it sends out the echo, or the, the sound beam. One way this works is when you are scanning, let's say a breast, the machine will have you compress and then release the tissue, and it measures the stiffness and the density as you are doing that. Let me show you an image. So this is what it looks like. On the left is just the B mode, but on the right is where it shows the elastography. So if you can see this area here, it's showing that that is a different stiffness than the surrounding tissue. And if you look on the on the B mode, you can see that there's there's a mass there, there's one here, and then you just have you have breast tissue in here, in here, maybe maybe a tendon here. And so if you look on the on the, the other image, you can see that it's separating the stiffness. So elastography and stiffness, let's just keep those two together. What else do we have? Harmonic resonance. What do we know about harmonics? If it's sending a beam, all it's gonna do is get the vibration of the tissue to send a signal back. That vibration will be double the frequency of the original beam. So that just gives us a better image. It allows us to image deeper with a higher frequency. That doesn't give us a three-dimensional image. Uh, spatial compounding. I have a whole video on this, so if you really want to know, because this is something they are hitting uh, particularly Hard on the exam right now. There's a full series on spatial compounding, but uh, just roughly what it does is let's let's say we have our probe here. It's going to send out basically beams in three different. Well, it's going to be a lot of drift, different directions, and take each of those as separate images and overlay them on top of each other, and the information that matches, it'll give us one image. This reduces a lot of noise because if it's not on all three images, then it probably doesn't actually exist. So it just uses, it's kind of like an average of three different images. And you can see as you use it that your frame rate will go down because it's having to work a little bit harder to get you there. So let's talk about the top one, surface rendering. Because we know it's not the other three, this kind of has to be our answer. And if you think about a three-dimensional object, you know, if you have an object that's, you know, in three dimensions, trying to draw a three-dimensional thing there. If our beam is coming down, it's going to scan across all of those in multiple different directions. And then it'll use the depth information that it has, as well as information from different directions. So there's different kinds. Sometimes it's the probe itself is mechanical and it'll sweep, and you'll actually feel it vibrate. Or the machine will want you to sweep your hand or the probe in an arc. But what that does is it it passes over the, the volume, and then it basically reconstructs it as a 3D image. So basically surface rendering, I mean, just think about the words, it's rendering a surface, will give you that three-dimensional image. 
All right, let's talk about our next question. Which technique utilizes frequency modulation of the transmitted pulse to improve signal to noise ratio? So we're talking about noise here. And a few of these actually have to do with noise. So this is one way that the test can get you where there's a few answers that seem right, but there's one answer that's more correct. So let's just talk about each of these and then we'll figure out which is the best answer. The first one, let's just eliminate, would be B, panoramic imaging. That is a way to image a large structure with the small face of our transducer. So I'm gonna show you a video of what that looks like. So as you can see the machine there, he starts the panoramic image and then he sweeps the probe and it paints a live image and creates one long image from that one single um, instance. So this is the whole neck, you know, with the complete thyroid. And we use panoramic imaging for just a, a something that's longer than the face of the transducer. So we know that it's not panoramic imaging. We already talked about spatial compounding and compounding does remove noise, but it's not the signal to noise ratio that it's, it's working with. It's doing an average of multiple images to remove noise. Uh, coded excitation. So what that does is it basically, it flags each signal. And let's say it puts a one on the first one and a two on the next one. Well, when those signals come back, so it'll send a signal down and it'll put a one and then it'll send another signal down and it'll put a two. When those come back, you know, this one will come back with a one and this one will come back with the two. But if there's noise that's generated, you know, that's bouncing around like this and it comes back, it won't have a marker. You know, something, something else comes back this way and it won't have a marker. So the machine says, this is not a true signal. This is not a true signal. Let's only listen to these two that are there. And so what, that is a way to remove noise because it only listens to the signals that it knows it sends out. Sends out. So that leaves us with appetization. So appetization, it says, hey, some of these beams are more important the ones towards the center of the beam. So we're gonna increase those. And the ones on the side, we're gonna decrease those because we wanna minimize our side lobes. The side lobes bounce around and just bring a lot of noisy signal back to the, the transducer. So when it's listening, it's getting a lot more information back than it actually sent out. So with appetization, they're increasing the width of the beam because the middle section of the beam is in the the intensity is increased and the edge of the beam it's decreased to minimize side lobes so by minimizing that the the side lobes we're actually improving our signal and decreasing our noise so i equate appetization with signal to noise ratio all right, this question says, which imaging modality can provide the most accurate measurement of tumor volume? And with these, you just have to know your modes. So let's talk about A mode. A mode's pretty simple. Let's just imagine we have our transducer here and we have our skin surface here and we have a tumor structure down in here. So our beam comes down and it images, and as every time, you know, it's sending back reflections, even from the skin surface. So our, our A mode graph will look something like this. As it hits this area, we'll have a spike, and then it'll the beam will travel down until it hits the next interface. We'll get another spike, next interface, another spike, and so on. So the intensity of the spike is the intensity of the reflection. So with this, we can measure this depth from here to here. And we can measure that, we can actually measure the depth of the mass, you know, the size of it from here to here. Basically that only gives us one 
level of information. And maybe we can come from another angle and measure. But it's pretty rare to be able to get three measurements, all three dimensions. You know, if, if we have our if we have our mass, we can get this measurement, and maybe we can we can image from over here and get this measurement. But generally, you can't get that third dimension with A mode. So B mode, that's what we use generally to image with. We can do our sagittal measurement and our transverse measurement, or however we're measuring, so we can get a good volume there. So sticking out, that one seems to be our best option. M mode is basically just A mode with t the time variable added. So rather than just the, the single, I'm going to draw it vertically, just rather than just the single um, bar of information, we get it over time as things change. And this is how we see our differences, you know, when we're measuring a fetal heartbeat or something. It's just A mode with the, with the time element added. So a good tip is if two answers mean the same thing, both of them are wrong. So if you ever get a question and two of them are saying the exact same thing but in different ways, both of them are wrong. Unless you're taking an exam where you can have multiple right answers, but the, this test does not do that. There's one answer. Color Doppler, what's that showing us? That's just showing us uh, movement of, of fluid, flow. So that's not going to be it. So this one's just right off the bat wrong, so that's easy. Let's just get rid of Color Doppler. We know that A and C are the same answer, so those are wrong. Even if we didn't know it was B, we've eliminated the other three answer, so it has to be B. All right, let's get to the last question. So what is dynamic aperture? Let's just go through each of these and we'll see where we end up. Aperture that varies with transmit frequency. So this is saying a probe that changes the frequency to dynamically change the aperture, or aperture that decreases as a function of time. So as time goes on, the aperture changes. We have aperture that increases with increasing focal length. And we have aperture that changes as a function of frame rate. So when I think about aperture, we're thinking about our transducer face. What's this distance right here? Because as our beam comes out, there's a thickness that's the same size as, as our transducer. And then we hit focal length and it diverges. So whenever I think about dy dynamic aperture, I always equate it with phased arrays. Keep those two terms together. So when you think about a phased array, our, our, our transducer face, imagine all the, the crystals are individually on that face. If we send out a single beam, we get this thickness. But if we have two little structures that are next to each other, we won't be able to, to resolve them independently because they're within that beam. So because we have these crystals, what if we, you know, let's say we have a structure here and a structure here. What if we only use these crystals to image? We can dynamically change our aperture size, the width of the beam, by only using certain crystals. So what they do is, if something's very shallow, it only uses a couple crystals, an image here. But as it gets deeper, it may need to increase the aperture width just to, to get down to that depth. So what we'll see is if we have a few different probes here and we're imaging at this depth or this depth or this depth, maybe we only fire a few crystals here, a few more to get down to here, and maybe we use the whole beam to get down to here. So we 
equate dynamic aperture with phased array and an aperture that increases with increasing focal length because we want our focus to be as deep as possible. The reason, another reason that we're worried about this is the beam doesn't actually go out parallel to the face of the transducer. It's like, you know, it's sloped and then af after the, the focal point, it diverges pretty rapidly. So if we only send out a small beam, well, it's going to diverge pretty quickly here. So if we send out a bigger beam, our focal point can be deeper and, uh, and our divergence is deeper. So again, aperture and focal length. Keep those in mind. All right, that's it for this episode. If you have any questions or you run across any practice questions you don't know, just email them to me and we'll go over them in a video just like this. Take care.